Okay. Is is it is it possible to? Oh yeah, we're going to have the people on screen as well that are. Right. I think we're probably ready to ready to start amidst the crowds of the last morning of the IGF, <laughs> eight forty-five in the morning. Uh, Hello everyone, my, my name is Jan Scholte, I'm at uh, Leiden University, I'm your on-site uh, moderator for this event uh, on the legitimacy of south-based regional internet registries. Um, I'm joined online by Hortense Jonger at the Free University of Amsterdam, for whom I believe it is two in the morning. Uh, Hortense is the coordinator of the project uh, to which this session refers, uh, and she is the online moderator. Uh, I'm joined by two speakers on site and two speakers online. Uh, to my left is Akinori Memora from the Japanese JPNIC, JPNIC Network Information Center. Uh, to my right is Henriette Esterhauser. Uh, former executive director of the Association for Progressive Communications and as active as ever. Um, online, we are joined by Carolina Aguera at the university. I'm, I'm, I'm my apologies, Carolina. I don't have the name of your university in Mont Montevideo is, is escaping me, but uh, you, you, many of you will know uh, Carolina from many IGF and other internet governance related uh, activities. Uh, and also online at, I believe, midnight for him, uh, Nikwe Noor, Professor Dr. Nikwe Noor, uh, and Accra Ghana, and one of the founders of the internet in Africa. So we are talking about the South-based uh, regional internet registries, and you see that our speakers are coming from the different uh, regions concerned, uh, Latin America, uh, Caribbean, Africa, and Asia Pacific. I'm going to hand over to our speaker to introduce the issues in a moment. Uh, that is Deborah Irene Christine, who is joining us online from Indonesia, from Jakarta. Uh, and then we will also involve at various other points in the proceedings several other members of the team of this project, uh, namely Gloria Enzeka at the University of Maryland uh, and Naima Nascimento Faleros. Uh, in the University, I believe it's Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. So I think that gives us a start at the setting. Um, I will hand over to Deborah now to introduce the issues. Um, thank you, Jan. Uh, so firstly, I'm going to share my screen. Let me just see it. Um, uh, hi everyone, so my name is Deborah. Uh, I am one of the researchers of, of this research team that is based of the that is based in the University of Gothenburg. But uh, as Jan shared, our research uh, team, I mean like our researchers are actually spread across the four continents uh, in the globe. And uh, we've been studying for the past year the role of regional internet registries based in the global south uh, in the global internet governance to understand how legitimacy works in internet governance and how people's views toward the legitimacy of south-based internet registries vary and why. And um, in this panel today, we have uh, four questions that uh, we will uh, address uh, through our own, um, through this presentation, but also through discussion with uh, the panelists. Um, and hopefully this presentation could shed a lot, some light uh, to answering those uh, questions. Uh, so this is the outline of the presentation. And uh, first of all, why are we interested in studying the RIRs? Um, so the RIRs are important actors in the global internet governance because of their core mandate uh, to allocate internet numbers, uh, IP addresses, and autonomous systems numbers in their respective regions. And uh, they also maintain the registry of that allocation. This enables all connected digital devices in the world uh, to have distinct locations on our single global internet. And as the backbone of the internet, 
um, internet protocol uh, has undergone various iterations to accommodate the evolving needs of our interconnected world. Uh, two of the most prominent versions, the internet protocol version 4 or IPv4 and IPv6, have played a crucial role in shaping the way uh, data is transmitted and received across the internet. And IPv4 is the number of version that was used mostly initially, but there's only 4.3 billion uh, V4 addresses, while there are 5.4 billion uh, regular internet users as of now. So the V4 version has become insufficient and the new version, which is V6, with the larger capacity, uh, there are 340 trillion, trillion, trillion of them. So uh, the V4 version enables more device connections, including IoT and smart technologies. However, the issue of cost and compatibility with devices running on V4, for example, has contributed to rather slow adoption of the V6 version. And as of now, uh, the global adoption is less than 50%. At the same time, IPv4 has run down so much, meaning that uh, in the last 10 years, there's been a scarcity issue and uh, secondary commercial market uh, has risen uh, 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 in the selling of IPv4. So in this case, the role of uh, the RIRs in the policy making of IP address allocation actually has implications on addressing the digital divides by enabling or not enabling uh, the world uh, to be interconnected, particularly the global south. And as part of their services, IRs also handle questions about internet access, uh, content control, network security and data protection. They also provide capacity building for engineers and also grants uh, for technical innovations. The RIRs also conduct measurements of internet use and performance. Uh, and these are the things that are they are doing uh, in addition to their core mandate. The second reason why we're interested in the RIRs is because they take a regional mode of governance of the internet, meaning that the rule or policies about the distribution of IP addresses are actually set by the communities in the region themselves. And uh, the third reason would be uh, the three RIRs that we are focusing on are based in the Global South. So AFRINIC, African Network Information Center, that serves the African region. APNIC, uh, that is Asia Pacific Network Information Center, uh, that is serving the Asia Pacific region. Uh, and LACNIC, uh, Latin America and Caribbean Network Information Center, uh, is serving the Latin American and Caribbean regions. So focusing on these uh, three South-based RIRs is actually a significant distinction from where the Internet's earliest development started, uh, which is in the Global North. And here lies the question about uh, what being South-based actually entails. Does that mean more autonomy in Internet governance outside of Europe and in North America? And uh, are the South-based RIRs important force to, to countering the, the digital divides? Um, the next reason is that uh, the RIRs actually facilitate decision and policy making for regional internet governance through multi-stakeholder collaboration. So it's between uh, businesses, civil society, uh, technical experts, and also governments. But in this case, government has no formal role, so they are just part of the uh, multi-stakeholder uh, multi stakeholderism uh, approach that's used in the RIRs. And the RIRs themselves, they are also private non not-for-profit organizations, so uh, they are incorporated as legal entity, AFRINIC in Mauritius, APNIC in Australia, and LACNIC in Uruguay. And this is actually a unique approach to governing internet resources as a global resource. And finally, considering that the lack of IP address space actually influences connectivity, the three RIRs, uh, AFRINIC, APNIC, and LACNIC, uh, as governance bodies which manage, distribute, and register internet number resources in their respective regions, are uniquely placed to address the issues of digital divides and inclusion in internet governance. 
So all of these reasons that you see on the slides, uh, plus the fact that there's little academic inquiry into uh, internet governance field in the internet governance field into the RIRs are actually why we're conducting this, this study. And this is the objectives of our study. We're trying to look at uh, on what basis and how far that these three South-based internet registries are attracting legitimacy. So how far people have belief, uh, trust, confidence, and approval in this alternative way of organizing internet governance. And uh, we hope that the findings will contribute to how we understand legitimacy with regard to multi-stakeholder global governance of the internet. Uh, but there's also this underlying uh, uh, objective. Uh, if we could show that indeed the regional South-based multi-stakeholder model to internet governance attracts a lot of legitimacy or is lacking legitimacy, and what the basis for such legitimacy perceptions uh, are, then uh, we could ask the question about uh, could a regional multi-stakeholder South-based approach to governing key global resources perhaps be transferred to other areas? And uh, could this approach also be part of a more uh, general South-based initiative on dealing with other critical global resources? And uh, this is a quick uh, overview about the rise of multi-stakeholder global governance. So the dark line in the middle are uh, the, uh, is the number of uh, intergovernmental treaty-based organizations. You can see that basically they've plateaued since the 1990s. Uh, there's, there isn't an increase in their numbers. Uh, also, if you look at the material resources and institutional institutional capacity uh, of these uh, uh, organizations to make decisions, uh, those uh, have also remained stable, if not declined, in the in the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, in contrast, you see the the, the dotted line uh, of multi-stakeholder global governance arrangements, and they've grown enormously uh, and are now more than twice as uh, num numerous as intergovernmental organizations and uh, indeed often have increasing resources and capacity at the time uh, that multilateralism uh, has told. Um, so in this study, we're looking at the legitimacy of South-based uh, RIRs, uh, that is to ask how far people believe and perceive uh, that they have that these RIRs have the right to govern and that they will exercise the right to govern appropriately or properly. So if these organizations have uh, secure legitimacy among their constituents, it gives them much more strength uh, and security and stability, and we can expect them to thrive. However, if, we, if they lack it, uh, well, then the South-based uh, regional multi-stakeholder governance of the internet might be in, in, in trouble. Um, in our study, we understand that legitimacy is not the only thing that makes governing work and the consequences of legitimacy or the lack of it are not always uh, straightforward. But uh, if you have legitimacy, you can uh, expect um, to have a more secure mandate to get more resources and participation, you can also expect uh, to, 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 to take decisions better and have more compliance for, from your constituents. And uh, you can also expect to have better problem solving capacity. And uh, maybe therefore uh, it is easier uh, for you to reach your goals and hold yourself uh, against competing institutions. Um, in a way, at the moment, we can see that uh, one of the RIRs that we are studying here, which is AP Afrinic, uh, is facing considerable legitimacy challenges, and, uh, and you can also see that they are struggling with some of the components in this list. Um, so uh, that might also serve as an example how uh, it will be challenging for an institution to govern without uh, or with a lack of legitimacy. In our interviews, we've been asking people uh, whether they think uh, the legitimacy of RIRs uh, is important to them. And it is uh, quite reassuring that our research find that 
84% of people actually say that it's extremely uh, important uh, for an institution, particularly RIR, uh, to have uh, legitimacy, um, as you can see in the, in the graphs here. Um, so we're doing extensive interviews with people, asking them about their confidence level in these RIRs, um, and looking at the number of sources that may be driving their legitimacy belief. We're asking how much confidence they have uh, in the RIRs and also how much they care about uh, the RIRs, as, as well as how much they feel attracted affected by, by, by these organizations. So we're not only asking about uh, uh, the, their level of confidence, but also how much they care and how much they feel uh, impacted by these organizations. So uh, this is actually where we are, our research is getting a little into the intricacies of legitimacy research, uh, but a lot of legitimacy research on regional and global governance has only asked respondents about how much confidence they have uh, in the organizations. It, has, it hasn't asked about how intensely they feel about these organizations. So uh, all of these, uh, most of these research ends up with uh, the results which say, uh, so people's average legitimacy belief uh, in the UN or ASEAN, for example, is the same as their legitimacy belief in their national government. But our impression is that people uh, probably care and feel more affected by their government than by an intergovernmental organizations like ASEAN or uh, the UN. Uh, so uh, it will be actually useful if we, uh, if you ask uh, those additional questions about um, um, care and, and uh, impact. And, uh, our research is still ongoing. So these are the interviews that we've done so far. There are 321. Uh, and you can see the breakdown of our respondents so far across the South-based RIRs and stakeholder groups. Um, uh, it's not that easy to get people to sit and stay with you to do the extensive interviews um, about all the different aspects of these RIRs. A lot of people we've interviewed uh, actually say that this is probably the point in their life that they have to think so hard in 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, so um, it's actually quite understandable that uh, we're still in the middle of uh, collecting this data. So we still cannot see that uh, these are uh, the results of uh, our study. And uh, just uh, to share some uh, emergent results from our study, which of course uh, not non-conclusive yet. Uh, we can say that there is variation in the levels of confidence between the three RIR, RIRs that we are studying. We find variation between stakeholder groups. Uh, so it depends on whether they come from civil society groups or business groups, uh, government uh, representations, technical groups, or an academic group. Uh, there is differences in terms how legit, how much legitimacy they have in the RIRs. Uh, and there is also a variation between groups in different social categories, uh, for example, by age, gender, and language. Um, so we have not yet been able to say what the drivers for these different levels of legitimacy belief uh, in the RIRs are, but on the basis of other research uh, and our initial findings, we think that we're going to find that institutional drivers uh, uh, such as uh, people's perceptions of the purpose of the RIRs, uh, their main dates, uh, the procedures that uh, they put in place, as well as their performance, are the main drivers of uh, confidence and legitimacy perceptions towards the RIR. Um, and some other psychological and prevailing so societal norms would also influence uh, uh, people's uh, legitimacy belief uh, towards uh, the RIRs. And we're still, as I said before, we're still completing our study. So if any of you uh, who are present in this uh, Zoom meeting uh, are interested in participating in our interview, please um, contact Ortans at ortans.yongen at uh, gu.se. Um, uh, that's it for me, Jan. Uh, over to you. 
Thanks very much, uh, Deborah. That gives an overview of the, 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 the work here. Uh, just to summarize again for, for a moment, we're looking at the regional internet registries, of which there are five, but we are looking mainly at those that are based in the global south, namely AFRINIC for Africa, APNIC for Asia Pacific, and LACNIC for Latin America Caribbean. Um, this is a quite unique construction in internet governance in being regional rather than globally focused, uh, multi-stakeholder rather than governmental, and south-centered when most of internet governance is based in Europe and North America. So there's something really interesting going on here. Um, and to the extent that it acquires legitimacy, you know, approval, confidence, trust of people, um, it's a very strong part of internet governance. To the extent that it struggles with legitimacy and confidence and trust, it's a major problem for internet governance. Because without the allocation of internet numbers and registries of internet numbers and associated training and cybersecurity and, and other operations, uh, the global internet doesn't function. So although the RIRs don't make the headlines, um, this is a really, really crucial part of uh, global internet governance. And we see with the current struggles with AFRINIC, one of these three organizations, just how far the implications can be when these, when these uh, regimes run into uh, legitimacy difficulties. So let me hand over to our uh, speakers, uh, our respondents. Um, and I think let's go in the order that they're, I think it's alphabetical by surname, but on my, li my list here. Shall we start with uh, Carolina Aguera in, uh, in Uruguay? I think you are still in your early evening, hopefully, so not uh, suffering the, uh, the midnight uh, uh, of, of, of Ni and Hortense. Uh, Carolina, do you want to give your comments? But I've been awake for 16 hours already oh at 4 a.m. <laughs> oh my time. Okay. I was participating in another session. So it's been a very long day. Um, well, thank you. And, and this, is, um, this is a super interesting study. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I'm, there, there, were, there are many questions that were, that were raised and, and, and we don't have that much time. But um, to me, uh, there, there is this... Um, and having having studied the development of of LACNIC in particular, that's the region I I know the mo the most. Um, for the Latin American internet community, that emerging uh, body of uh, network engineers, uh, scholars coming from their PhDs and masters in northern North American and Canadian universities mainly. There was a legitimacy problem in being served only by someone in in California who had really uh, not much time, <laughs> and and really wanted to sort of these communities to have <laughs> their own uh, interests and their own needs addressed uh, in their own language, in their time zone, uh, in 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 a much in a subsidiary uh, subsidi level of sus subsidiarity that would be closer to to them and that would reflect their their current uh, uh, structures and particularly the linguistic issue was was something that was striking in 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 my understanding in my 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 research around uh, the the origins of this so um there there is there is a global multi stakeholderism in internet governance is already in my view sort of uh, in in its from its inception and the idea that local communities need to become involved to shape the, this internet it's already beginning to set to pave the 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 path for for something as as the arrangements that we have these days of uh, regional internet registries serving their uh, geographic communities, um, which are m m more or less diverse in the different parts of, of the world. Um, so um, that, that that's a, a preliminary thing, I, a idea I wanted to raise. Then there's, um, when discussing this idea about uh, multi-stakeholder internet governance and the perspective of, of RIRs, um, I... They are multi-stakeholder. It would be interesting to, to refine in, in which way would we conceive of an RIR as multi-stakeholder because um, we think of ICANN as the epitome of a multi-stakeholder formal institution. RIRs are, in, in, which, in which way do, do they 
represent multi-stakeholder values? Is it because they are um, self-regulated and self-governed by their own communities of stakeholders and because they are so open, because most of us can participate even if we don't have an IP resource and we can shape those policy development processes. So I think it raises, I mean, addressing um, RIR governance in, in all, all kinds of RIRs, <laughs> in the five of them, but uh, in, in the Global South, it raises again, how can multi-stakeholder, multi-stakeholderism be understood and, in, and what is the particular flavor that this uh, RIRs bring to, to the multi-stakeholder debate uh, and, and, and the actual governance of, of these critical internet resources around IP, IP numbers uh, and addresses. Um, in terms of the, the added value or the the participation um, and the, I mean, I mean the, what, what do these uh, RIRs and, and LACNIC in particular, how have they ser helped to serve their, their particular communities and, and, and different stakeholders in the regions? I think it's, it's, it's crucial in the way that they bring closer to home uh, the idea of, of the global internet. I mean, not just by developing the functions and the allocation of IP addresses and in uh, that, that is already defined by their own policies and their communities. It's uh, in, in the case of Latin America, without uh, an RIR, there, there would have been, it would have been very difficult to talk about an, an internet community, a, a broader internet community that would go beyond the technical um, pioneers uh, who who were um, uh, challenging the 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 telecommunication operators and national regulators that were not prone to to open their networks to 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 these new communication infrastructures. So so it's a it's a fo focal point to discussing broader um, global. Uh, internet uh, institutions, internet processes, and, and that is, it brings closer to home that which uh, I think is, is, is extremely relevant. If we want to address how is the global south and the developing world in general or the rest of the world connected to this broader globalization processes and, and internet governance processes. And, and finally, and something I think that um, um, LACNIC and, and APNIC have done particularly well is is to help to develop a, a development agenda around around the internet and that goes beyond just the development of the um, technical dimension of the internet and has even allowed uh, digital rights movements and uh, other other um, civil society actors and governments to engage uh, in a more uh, dense ecosystem with a, a denser agenda around what does uh, internet governance mean and not just the, the governance of the internet, but the implications are about the consequences and the uses of the internet. And this slightly broadening of the agenda of, of RIRs in, in, with their funding towards support, the support of community projects over the last long decade, I'm, I'm not exactly sure now whether it's over 10 to 15 years, I think that is, uh, it, that is, that is very relevant and that is very important to, uh, to bring in the, the legitimacy um, perspective as well, and that they are uh, serving their, their communities be, beyond their strict and narrow mission and have a broader um, interest in, 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 in shaping and understanding and enriching uh, these discussions. So um, those are my initial comments around uh, this issue. Thank you so much for sharing all this information and the study, which is fantastic. Thank you, Carolina. I, I uh, wish I could be so, so sharp and insightful after 16 hours. Thanks very much. Um, Ariete, do you want to take the next step? Thanks, Jan. And only the, the, the question on role, not lessons learned. Are we going to do that later? Or can I do all of it now? Okay. Um, 
I think that, I, well, firstly, Carolina, very nice to be in the same space with you after many years of not being in the same space. Carolina and I were on the IJF mag at the same time many years ago. Um, I support everything Carolina said. I'll maybe just emphasize a few things and then talk a little bit about where I think we can improve. I think um, absolutely the role's very important. I think the financial support, the work done by the AP NIC Foundation and, and also by LACNIC um, partnerships, the LACNIC partnership and AP NIC Foundation partnerships with the IDRC, for example, um, that, that financial support has actually strengthened the ecosystem, the support for community-centered connectivity. Um, both at the level of financial support, but also at the level of messaging, that there are alternative ways to just relying on mobile operators. Um, so this advocacy role um, in, in extending and strengthening um, internet in, in global south um, spaces has been very important. Um, I think the, 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 the knowledge sharing, um, the events, the summits, Apricot, African Information Summit, you know, when they work, these events bring together people, um, they build network, they strengthen the ecosystem, and I think that's very important. I think the, 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 the voice in the global, the role that they play in, in strengthening the global South voice in the global IG ecosystem, I want to stress that even further because I think we still are sitting with an imbalance in terms of whose voices are most and whose voices are loudest and, and most influential in the multi-stakeholder internet governance ecosystem. And we'll never change that if we don't have strong institutions in, in the global south. And in fact, the whole legitimacy of this multi-stakeholder ecosystem, which is pretty, you know, it's often being questioned, we have to admit that it's often being questioned, rests on the fact that it's supposed to be inclusive. And if this global multi-stakeholder internet governance ecosystem, by that I include the IGF, ICANN, you know, the RIRs and, and those around them, cannot be more balanced in terms of global south, global north influence and voices, it won't sustain or grow its legitimacy. So the role that the RIRs play, particularly because they have technical expertise, they're not just talking about the experience of being in parts of the world where most of the unconnected are, they actually understand the, 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 the policy and the, the technical and the human social environment. Um, so I can't, I, I really can't stress their importance enough. Has it worked? I think yes, but not well enough. And I think um, that's completely understandable. And I think that it's, they're still relatively new institutions. Well, not all of them, but, but, um, but relatively. And I think, you know, one of the, for me, one of the big differences between the multilateral and the multi-stakeholder system is that, um, you have more flexibility with a multi-stakeholder system, but you also have more responsibility in a way because you you have to build it yourself. You have to evolve it and make it fit to purpose. Multilateral systems are kind of structurally broken and also structurally um, functional because they are kind of more rigid and more fixed. Um, and I think that's where we need to place the emphasis. So, and I'll speak here more about Afrinic, um, and, and Ni knows much more than I do. I'm kind of more of an observer. Um, I think that, that here is an example where we need to evolve the institution. Africa has a much smaller constituency for its RIR. Than, than other regions. So I think from the outset, having involved maybe more not-for-profits, more civil society organizations, more people like myself, um, uh, it, who are working not in a registry or, or registrar context, but who is still very much part of the ecosystem, that might have been a way of strengthening the base of, of Afrinic and in that sense also strengthening its governance structure and its institutional capacity. Um, this might not be necessary in other regions or in other regions like in LACNIC, it could be done through partnership with, with other institutions. So I do think there's a need to, to adapt your, your, your internal RIR governance and, and management structure to 
the, the, the ecosystem in the region. I think the other area, you know, where I think more, more um, evolution can take place is at the level of collaboration and support between the RIR. So at the, the NRO, the, 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 the sort of overarching body level, um, they're all very independent, and I think they prize their independence, but I think there is a need for collaboration, and sometimes that collaboration can be informal, sometimes it might need to be a little bit more formalized. And I think that's what we've seen with the Afrinic situation, where we have had a bad actor, in my view, I'm comfortable calling this person a bad actor, um, um, making um, money out of numbers that were procured in an inappropriate, not quite due process driven way from Afrinic, but leasing them in other regions. And yet there seems to be no capacity there for for, for APNIC to intervene or to have any relationship with, with national, um, you know, with, with, with the national uh, oversight bodies or the, the CCTLDs or the registries. So I think that, the, I mean, this is a perfect example, actually, the Afrinic case. I think Afrinic will survive. I think Afrinic still does good work. You could just go and look at the Afrinic website and you'll find fantastic resources there. But I think there is a need to build this kind of emergency response and a little bit more structural level of collaboration because this might also happen to other RIRs. I think sometimes I feel there's an assumption that all the RIRs are, are just fine. It's only Afrinic that, that ha is challenged because it's in Africa. And I think that's a, I question that assumption. I think Afrinic has had particular um, challenges. But I think you know institutions are fragile. They are they are some they are vulnerable to to personal dynamics and to industry dynamics. Um, and I think it's worth actually thinking about how to build in more robustness um, in this uh, this bottom up and not not always as inclusive as it could be. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Super. Again. Very, very, very good. Excellent, Excellent start to, the, to, this, uh, to this conversation. Akinori, you, you, yep. you've got the burden to keep it going. <laughs> uh, I am not enough to, you know, <laughs> succeed the, the, the activeness of the discussion from Manriet. Um, uh, before that, uh, my name is Akinori Maimura. Hi, good morning, everyone. Ohayo gozaimasu from Kyoto. Uh, my, uh, and then I am working for the JPNIC, Japan Network Information Center, one of the uh, National Internet Registry under APNIC, and then uh, Internet Promotion Body. I sometimes says my company is doing the half APNIC, -ish, half isoc -ish business. That's that's what uh, my business are. Then uh, I I am the uh, 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 the uh, a bit more of the back background. I am the active participant to the APNIC process, and then uh, I I. I served, lo long served at the APNIC Executive Council, which is the governing board of APNIC. And then uh, I stepped down from there seven years ago, but still an uh, active member uh, at the APNIC. So uh, that's, that's who I am. And then uh, uh, t uh, thank you very much, Deborah, Deborah, for your presentation. And uh, this will, uh, will organize uh, the, what is the, the legitimacy of the RIL. And then, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Henriette uh, kicked off the, you know, the argument of the Afrinic situation, and I uh, feel like feel like follow follow her for that. But uh, before that, uh, I, I'd like to uh, uh, say something for the Afrinic situation. So uh, 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 Afrinic had some a tough time and a big turbulence in there, but uh, Afrinic had some of them. Uh, by the, some some of the the ab abusive the conduct in the election uh, in uh, in the last last March uh, this, uh, March this year and then uh, uh, Epinic actually uh, did a great job to uh, address uh, that kind of a situation uh, by uh, the executive council uh, made uh, uh, made a great decision and the firm steps uh, toward uh, the changing the, its constitutional. Uh, arrangement, then, and then uh, the, uh, the actually the, the bylaws is a really hard to change by the management. I'm um, no, sorry, mem membership, uh, because it uh, requires the, the uh, uh, supermajority, two thirds 
of the, the entire vote, vote count, which is uh, the almost virtually uh, never can be achieved. But uh, it, it, it was changed into the, uh, the uh, uh, two thirds of the, the total vote cast. Uh, so it, it is uh, uh, practically uh, changeable. Then they, need, uh, they did the change of the bylaw uh, this, uh, just three, three weeks ago, just here in the, in the Kyoto Inter International Conference Center. Then uh, that, that is a great, uh, great uh, historic uh, 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 epoch uh, for the for the ethnic membership, uh, for the for them to change the, the its own uh, its own constitution. So uh, that's uh, one of the uh, quite, quite uh, it it it, it uh, contributes to the uh, maintaining the legitimacy of the ethnic. And then uh, the Deborah says that uh, uh, in, in, in her presentation, she, she's got the, the, the some, some aspect of the legitimacy. And then uh, I, I, can, I am quite proud to say that uh, APNIC is uh, quite, ah, by the way, APNIC is, uh, yeah, this, this session is a South-based uh, RIL, but uh, APNIC actually, yeah, in terms of the, the, the place of the incorporation, yes, that, that is incorporated in Brisbane, it's, I uh, can say, the South based, but APNIC is uh, the, uh, maybe the only, only, only uh, RIR uh, out of the five RIRs who, uh, which cover North. <laughs> then uh, I'm from North. <laughs> then, uh, so, <laughs> but, but with that said, uh, the APNIC discussion is quite balanced. For example, the Executive Council uh, has the, the members from the North and the South, and then, and then uh, that's very really well balanced. And then, uh, for example, the discussion on for the virus change, there, there, there are a lot of active, active intervention from, the, from, from the, the South Asia or the Oceania. And we had uh, uh, the people from the, the Pacific Islands for the, 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 the forum leadership. So uh, EPNIC is quite well balanced. Uh, the, the many, many people from the, the all, around the, uh, all around the region can uh, put the put the influence to the APNIC uh, governance. So uh, uh, that that is actually well uh, well represents the, the legitimacy of the APNIC for my sense. So um, and then actually the uh, uh, one one uh, one of the remarkable uh, situation for the for the uh, our contribution to the internet governance globally is that I, I would say that uh, LACNIC and the APNIC uh, made a collaborative project to, uh, to for the research of the, the technical success factor. It's uh, uh, years uh, before. Uh, and then that's that's a commission to the the uh, sorry uh, analysis Mason and that's great uh, great great research to uh, to uh, analyze the what is the, the success uh, criteria success factor uh, in the, in the technical term of the internet and that kind of thing is uh, uh, you know that contributes to the global uh, global internet from the uh, the south based RIL. I stop here. Thanks. Thank you, Akinori. Um, again, wonderful to get uh, di different perspectives. We have one more speaker to come in, coming out, and then we'll then we'll then we'll bring you in, uh, in the audience here. Thanks. I'm glad you're eager to go. Um, uh, but first, we hear from uh, uh, Professor Nikwe Noor, uh, coming to us online uh, from Ghana. Uh, many of you will know uh, Professor Ni as uh, the one of the founders and first chair of the board of Afrinic, so has a long historical perspective on, on that particular RIR and may have uh, thoughts on the others as well. Uh, Ni, it's over to you. Well, th thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad to be part of this discussion. Um, yeah, perhaps before I give a reflection on uh, uh, the material I, I, I enjoyed listening to, I'd like to raise question on legitimacy of even the identifiers themselves. In other words, the legitimacy is not from mandate by anybody, uh, is by people, you know, happily willing to use them. So the more there is use uh, and the more there's dependency on them, the legitimacy is being earned, okay? Now, um, we can then discuss the, the concepts and the legitimacy that was expressed. But I, I tend to think that Afrinic 
does not really have, uh, not really facing legitimacy problems. And that's why I like uh, Henriette's perspective on that. It's a bad actor and a bad actor that has been found out that's throwing tantrums. And that can happen in any of the RRs. And in fact, uh, there were attempts, but from the experience that played out publicly uh, in the case of Afrinic, uh, other RRs were therefore uh, well aware of the bad actor. And so were able to to follow their tracks. And I say this with confidence because the bad actor and its, um, you know, you might say organization or followers um, uh, first attempted to achieve things through the policy development process, uh, which in our case is very open um, and is defined in such a way that everybody's voice can be heard. And, and so the bad actor uh, tried in numerous ways to push policies through that you might say will benefit one particular party. All these did not go through, did not get consensus, which shows that the multi-stakeholder process we practice is actually quite strong and, and was able to, you know, in some sense, uh, resist those, even to the extent of having co-chairs that were acting improperly, perhaps in concert with the desires of this particular bad actor, were recalled. So from that point of view, I think we can get a result that says that the multi-stakeholder process uh, actually is able to survive the extreme practices that may come from an open environment of, of this kind of, of, of development. And perhaps in the same vein, you know, um, I, I might want to comment that uh, uh, it has, in fact, worked in the sense that um, Afrinic has been able to rally many of the ecosystem communities around. For example, you have the AF Star, and the AF Star itself is made up of, uh, you know, other community, so to speak. For example, you have uh, the NOC community, which shares to an extent the same community as the, the NIC community, and had also been able to rally together the emergency response teams and also the research and education networks, uh, as well as the CCTLDs. And, and so it acts as part of that ecosystem of these varied organizations all playing together. And it has worked, the ecosystem itself has worked because in the case where Afrinic was taking all these uh, abuses and it had reached a stage where there's, you might say, court intervention and it was not able to function properly, the ecosystem acted meaning the NOG was AFNOG was able to hold the AIS meeting and give Afrinic a chance to be able to be discussed by the same community that they shared together and so on. And uh, Afrinic has been funding some local regional research projects. It also has a similar, uh, you know, you might say grant programs. It also has similar education programs. It also supports uh, local activities in, in other countries and uh, participates in the IGF events, participates in the telecom union activities that are within the region. And so its presence is actually missed is, is, is what, what, what I would like to add in, in that regard. I think for opening comments, that, that would be sufficient. Great, thank you very much, Ni. Nee. Um, so we've heard the uh, overarching introductory presentation from Deborah and reactions from a first round of, of reactions and comments from our, our, our speakers from the different regions. I think we'll take a phase of comments from the audience, uh, both here and uh, online. If you're online and you want to uh, raise points, then Gloria is our online uh, moderator. Sorry, I got the roles wrong a moment ago. Um, and we'll 
pick up here in the room and we already have a ready speaker. Could you let us know who you are if, for the record also? Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Carolina Caeiro, so another uh, Carolina from the Latin American region. Um, I am with uh, Oxford Information Labs and the DNS Research Federation and, and I'm also a former um, staff member of LACNIC. Um, so the first thing I wanted to say is that I'm very um, grateful that this session was organized and that we are openly having this conversation um, at IGF. I think it's an important issue to be discussing um, with the community and to, you know, sort of put some of these concerns um, out in the open and, and sort of have a, uh, a conversation within IGF um, about this issue. I wanted to start off by adding a few things um, about what I think are the strengths of the RIRs, um, uh, which are, you know, somewhat, um, you know, based in, you know, my experience working for LACNIC and also, you know, I've been, uh, you know, I've had the pleasure of, you know, running into my former RIR colleagues um, at IGF and, you know, I've been telling them how, now that I'm outside the RIR system, how I sort of see the value of a lot of the things that we did uh, here at IGF and, and at the regional level. Just to sort of add, so I don't sort of repeat some of the points that were said, one of the things that I think is really interesting about the LACNIC region and the work that it's done, sort of building, uh, you know, an internet community really within Latin America is the fact that it's also built trust. Um, and I think, you know, uh, in, you know as, as of recent, you know, following the, the situation with Afrinique, we've seen the community trusting LACNIC leadership as well um, in enacting uh, sort of, you know, changes, for instance, to its code of conduct um, that, you know, are things that have gone to sort of reinforce the governance structure of the RIR. And I think the fact that, you, you know, they have built that trust over the years, that the community really believes in the organization. Uh, again, trust uh, staff, the leadership is very, very crucial because it gives it legitimacy uh, going to, to the point of the, the, the previous intervention. Um, I also think it's very important that the RIRs are reflective of issues of the regions. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, everyone's commenting how this IGF has been all about AI, the AIGF, uh, you may have heard. Um, and that's very distant from some of the realities that we are discussing in our regions, right? Um, you know, I think of the work um, of, of LACNIC, you know, we're, you know, uh, we, I'm no longer there actually, but, um, you know, I still feel, very, you know, the, their mission very close to my heart, but the, the organization engages, you know, in uh, efforts around connectivity, supporting community networks, uh, supporting the establishment of IXPs. Um, so I think, you know, sort of prioritizing, if you will, um, uh, and taking sort of the conversation to the regional and local level is something that the RIRs also uh, greatly contribute to. Um, sort of looking forward a little bit, I, um, uh, I was actually making notes for this intervention and yet I literally wrote, you know, I think the NRO and, you know, the RIRs can perhaps strengthen how they support one another. Um, and I was, you know, writing that down right before you said it. Um, and I wanted to sort of add on the point that you made. I think, you know, there's also perhaps an opportunity to socialize what the NRO and the RIRs are doing, for instance, to support Afrinic right now, to sort of... Um, send a message of tranquility to the community as well that, um, you know, the RIRs are, be, are, are being very proactive and, and speaking to colleagues, I'm realizing there's a lot that's being done. We catch a little bit here and there from the news or social media, but I feel like, you know, perhaps stronger messaging would be useful. And the reason why I say this, you know, as of late I've been participating in standards organizations and I've seen concerns about the RIR system being brought up uh, in the context of I, um, IETF. Um, and whether, uh, you know, RIRs are sort of, you know, reliable to be running RPKI uh, services, for instance, or concerns uh, at, uh, you know, ITU's plenipotentiary uh, around, uh, you know, the role of Afrinic. And, and I think that, you know, proactively addressing those concerns, which are, you know, valid, um, and sort of sending a, perhaps a clear message and, you know, what's the action plan, what's the ask of the community, what, how, what do we do to help? Um, I think would be um, extremely useful. Uh, so I will leave it at that for an intervention, but thank you for organizing this panel, and I look forward to, I know my colleagues from the RS are here, and I look forward to hearing from them. Thanks, uh, thanks so much. Uh, do you want to hand the, the mic to Paul? Uh, Paul Wilson from, uh, from APNIC. Um, Thanks very much to Jan Art and to Hortense for this uh, for this work. I think it's um, it's kind of a 
a compliment and a recognition of the of the RARs that you've you've undertaken. This is a second, uh, also as a second uh, generation of the work that you've been doing, and, and I think it is valuable. So thank you. Um, I personally, I, I can't speak for other R RARs, but I think I could speak uh, as the head of of APNIC that we welcome the attention. Actually, that. Um, Times are, are changing and they've changed a lot since the beginning of, of the WISIS process when I think as everyone knows the, the top um, lot, uh, issues in internet governance seem to be around ICANN and, and critical internet resources and so on. And I think we did, we did very well working together in, um, in articulating and having understood the, the system that we all uh, work on and build together uh, to give confidence that it's, uh, that it's working well, um, that uh, that there are more important issues to, to move on to and, and indeed uh, in the years after that um, the IGF in the later years uh, since then the IGF has definitely moved on to other issues but I think there's a, there's a risk when we say uh, that things are working well um, that we sort of do draw attention elsewhere and we sort of get taken for granted that the things uh, in the RARs are, are solid and, and there's nothing to see here and that while that's generally true I, I really welcome the the fact that you know we're being seen still as important bodies working in very complex, uh, uh, in a complex field, increasingly complex with increasing challenges and so on, and uh, and uh, we do um, merit some some attention. Um, and I'm not saying I'm uh, I'm not saying that in in any other way than in the sort of constructive towards the sort of constructive um, ends that um, that I th that I think and with the constructive. Um, approach that I think you've taken. So um, I think uh, I'd be, be happy for this work to, to continue, for, um, for us to be looking at more and other um, aspects of the way that the um, regional internet registries work, that the, that the overall approach to IP address management works. I think we can be confident that, uh, that we can work together with, with folks who, are, um, who might be um, interested in, who might help us with evolution. And um, again, speaking not for the rest of the RARs at all, but uh, that's the way I see things. And I think it's also good, one of the things that's, um, that's come out of recent events is, uh, is greater attention from ICANN. So the RARs have had a, quite an independent uh, relationship with ICANN, a relationship of independence with ICANN. We, we, predate, we always say we predate ICANN. ICANN came along afterwards and, and sort of gave us, uh, and in some cases tried to give us, um, in not so welcome a sense, a, um, a sort of an umbrella. Um, but, but actually, I think we're starting to see um, the, again, speaking for uh, APNIC, I think we're starting to see the role of ICANN and the, and the ability that we, the opportunity that we have to work much more closely, not only with, uh, with each other, as, as I think uh, um, has been mentioned, but also with ICANN and, um, and indeed uh, more closely again with the rest of the technical community, uh, which, uh, which does require in some way uh, across all of its diversity, incredible diversity, it, it requires some some um, mechanisms of solidarity, of coordination, of um, of um, cooperation that that can still be can still be improved. So thanks again for uh, for giving us a lot to think about. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't say that. What do I think? I just told you. <laughs> Uh, th th thank you, Paul, and I, I do want to record uh, uh, actually our thanks to the secretaries of all three, uh, AFRI-NIC, AP-NIC, and, uh, and LAC-NIC. Um, you've been extremely open, and uh, we've, been, we've, been, we've been extremely open that we are independent, critical academics, uh, but the, the different secretaries have been en entirely open to us, and, 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 and we've had a really full, full exchange, and I think the results of the, of the work will be really, really substantial as a result, so thank you for, thank you for that. Please. Thank you very much, Janat. My name is Peter Bruck. I'm the chairman of the World Summit Awards, and we are working in the VISIS process over the last 20 years to promote and to select the best practices of using ICT and the internet uh, for positive social impact. Uh, and we are building uh, very much on the side of the people who are the creative users of the internet and uh, showcase and bring their voices into also the business process. I have a couple of comments to make and then a question. Uh, first, um, I thought that the study which was reported is quite impressive in its ambition. I have not seen a study similar to that uh, 
trying to have 425 interviews, uh, of which 321 are completed. I think that's an incredible I mean, effort. And uh, I think it's uh, very important to uh, follow up on that study and also to summarize and, uh, and um, build narratives of uh, uh, the conclusions from this. And I would very much look forward to this. The second point is that I, uh, Nick Kramer was um, looking at the concept of legitimacy. And I think that's a very, very important part that is uh, legitimacy uh, by mandate versus legitimacy by acceptance by the community in its use. And I think this is something which needs to be uh, focused on more, stressed more, and also seen as a very important uh, concept to support the multi-stakeholder uh, operation processes and also uh, its uh, weight in terms of policy making. The last point uh, which I have is uh, very much to, has very much to do with this uh, underbelly of the economics of the RRIs. Uh, I think it's uh, what is missing in m much of the discussions and much of the reflections, uh, including legitimacy and also impact is what are the economics of the internet operation and also in which way does this um, reflect and also mitigate or not mitigate the market power which is actually exercised through the internet. And I think we need to be less naive and less, let's say, uh, closing our eyes to this because in many of the discussions I think uh, the uh, technological imperialism of uh, the five platform companies uh, using the internet is uh, something which I think needs to be more openly addressed, reflected upon, and also included in governance considerations and, uh, and policy making. Thank you very much. Thank you also, great. Some very, very, very nice uh, interventions from the from the audience here. Uh, Gloria, are you having anything going on online? Um, no, we don't have any questions at the moment. Okay, okay, good. Um, in in the room here, also those who are not at the heart of RIR dynamics, please please say how things look to you because that's actually very interesting too. The RIRs are sometimes are, not, are yeah to know what people outside the, the, the core thinks is, is, also, uh, is also interesting and important. Well, I, 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 yes, please. Thank you. Um, sorry to say this is going to be another RER voice, but one from the north, and, and I waited until there was a, an, an opening, so I didn't, uh, you know, jump in line. I, I, my name's Einar Bolin. I'm from Erin, so the, the registry for Canada, the U.S., and, the Car and a good portion of the Caribbean. I wanted to say thank you to the uh, presenter for a fascinating uh, study that's underway, and I look forward to the final outcome, the the, the, the uh, publication of the of the pro of the the uh, project uh, during uh, Carolina's talk online, she mentioned the RERs and how they were founded on some principles, including uh, better customer service, including uh, time zones and languages that the people in the region spoke. I wanted to call out uh, one other really foundational principle, which is regional policy. The RERs allow for there to be uh, policy best suited to the region, um, to that particular region. And, and as an example, uh, in, in the Aran region about 10 years ago, uh, a community member came and wanted uh, a number policy to make it easier for community networks to get IP addresses. And after discussion and consensus review through, through the PDP at Aran, we, uh, Aaron, um, the community did create a policy to make it easier to get numbers uh, for community networks. Uh, so those were just two things that I, I wanted to say. 
you know, we, this meeting is about the internet uh, that we want, and one of the um, uh, pillars of that, I think, is connecting the unconnected. It occurs to me as, a, as I'm sitting here today and I'm talking about regional policy that, that community members at RIRs could look for ways to help connect the unconnected through number policy. So, thank you. Great, thank you indeed. Um, maybe let's go back and have another round from, from, our, from, our, from our panel um, and maybe reflect on some, 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 some bigger issues uh, that have come out of the comments uh, here too. I, I hear a lot both from you on the, the panel but also from the different uh, uh, reactions from the audience. The importance of, of process, procedures and governance structures, so the, the, the possibilities that, uh, that, 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 that those give. Um, I've also heard you know, questions, is multi-stakeholderism different in, in when, it's, when it's regional? Is it different when it's... Uh, with or, or are they multi-stakeholder at all? Yes, I mean th this was this 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 is this is a comment that that's uh, that's come up um, a little bit too. Is regional the way to go? Is it, I mean, although regionalism or region-centered governance in the internet is the is the exception in the in the in the numbers area, um, is it something that actually should be tried and pushed more uh, if it if it is more accommodating to the to the differences of different parts of the world and more sensitive to the context, more getting closer to communities and so on. So is this something that should be that, that we should be drawing out uh, out still more? Um, is it important in addressing the so-called digital divide or divides? Uh, do do does the fact of being regional and multi-stakeholder and based? In the global south, even if Brisbane, um, does that uh, does 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 that uh, help us with uh, addressing the the digital divide in in, in ways that more global centered, north centered uh, uh, approaches don't? Anyway, I throw some various issues on on the table, just to some some bigger bigger lessons that we might draw from this approach to internet well, governance. Can, can I, I ask please, please a go. question? Yes. Because I think I'm the 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 least close to NROs of all the, the or RIRs of all the speakers. I mean, I think they, the RIRs themselves know best uh, I mean, who they are and, and where they you know, what their strengths are. I think maybe not all IR, RIRs are equally multi-stakeholder. So I think that's something to think about and if that does give you more robustness. But I think my question to the speakers and to the RIR people in the room is, what do you think? Would would where would you like the next step to be to create um, that strengthening that that and that sort of ability to respond to crises that that was you know that has been difficult in the case of Africa? What do you what would you like to see um, um, in terms of your evolution and? Where do you think can the rest of the community and how can, can the rest of the community support that process of, of evolution? And what are the bottlenecks? Are there bottlenecks within how you currently operate and interact and communicate with one another that's making evolving your governance structures difficult? Okay, does anyone want to pick that up? Uh, Paul in the room or, or me online or... I'm happy to, uh, to make a couple of comments. Um, I, did, I fielded a question, a critical question years ago that uh, asserted that the RARs were not sufficiently multi-stakeholder. And I said, well, we are members of the technical community. Do you, do you expect us to have a, an internal multi-stakeholder structure that, that, that accommodates the, the uh, IGF uh, structures? Um, and I think that's, that kind of circularity doesn't make much sense. But multi-stakeholder is context contextual, and I think you could say that we've got the IGF multi-stakeholder um, uh, system. We've got um, different approaches to managing and to structuring stakeholders. So ICANN, in fact, is a multi-stakeholder uh, system which has got, it, which defines at large, it defines CCTLDs, it defines GTLDs. And you could say that, that they've their own multi-stakeholder structure which is very structured, actually, actually incorporates those things. APNIC recognises uh, that we have members with a special relationship with APNIC. We have a number of NIRs with a special relationship with APNIC, and we have a wider community. So we could also talk about ourselves having a multi-stakeholder structure comprising at least those three 
categories. It's not particularly structured in our case. I mean, we don't, um, we, we do afford, um, members are, are able to vote in, in APNIC elections and, and non-member members of the community are not, but they are able to participate in, in policy processes which are entirely open. So that's a fairly, it's a fairly loose and simple, simple structure. And I think, so I think what's, I mean, it's important to understand really what, what question we're asking and to what extent we actually need to have a structured multi-stakeholder system. And I think that's, that um, is something that's uh, in the hands of the, of the communities that we serve as to whether or not they would like to see more structure, more recognition of, of our own individual particular stakeholders. And it's, it's a question that could well, it, it could well come up. But I think probably what's, mo mo what's more important is that we not only are members of the technical community, but we are active participants in the multi-stakeholder internet governance system. And so we do um, make ourselves open. At the RIRs are different, so we've all got uh, different approaches, but in general, we make ourselves open to participation and we, we invest a lot in participation in the multi-stakeholder system. We report into our communities, back into our communities about our activity, about the organisational activities here and try to encourage community members to be part of that, that process as well. And um, much more than, say, 20 years ago, we were intention intentional about that. So there used to be a, a kind of a, I could say, a kind of a lazy or passive approach which said, we're open, the doors are open, anyone can come. But there's not much point in saying that if, if no, nobody even knows the door is there, right? So we're much more intentional these days about making sure that we are actively inclusive. Um, in in our in our work in our community and in, in promoting that across the uh, across the community and, and our activities. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. I think we'll, we'll take Carolina in yeah. the room here, and, and then Carolina comments. online uh, and me online. If you have uh, comments waiting after that, then I'll hand over to you in no. a moment. Please. We'll take Carolina in the room first, and then Carolina virtual second. Yeah. Is that on? Okay. I was just saying, Cara, I'll let you come after me. Um, so, um, I, yeah, I wanted to sort of comment on the, the multi-stakeholder point. I think there's a, a very similar conversation going on at ITF about ITF not be, being fully multi-stakeholder and, and this sort of notion that just by being open, uh, you know, it doesn't make it necessarily multi-stakeholder. Um, and I actually wanted to sort of support um, your point uh, just now. I think... Uh, what makes an RIR part of the multi-stakeholder community is in part the global engagement that they do, um, you know, the outreach they do with governments, the engagement they do with civil society, the fact they participate in spaces like, you know, IGF. And I think we need to be realistic about what we ask of the multi-stakeholder model. Um, you know, uh, at LACNIC, you know, uh, to, to sort of give an example from, you know, when I used to work there, uh, this, you know, the space is open to whoever wants to come. There's an effort to welcome civil society. There's an effort to welcome um, uh, governments and, and sort of, a, you, know, a, you know, academics and a diverse community. But there's so much participation that you can achieve from those stakeholders. And, you know, I'm, and I don't think that's, a, you know, a measure of failing or, or, or success of, of the RIRs. You know, I, I don't think that just having the people in the room is what we need to be sort of striving for. And as long as the, you know, the ITF or the RIRs are sort of engaging with the wider ecosystem, that's what gives you the multi-stakeholderism. Um, and, you know, and, and, but, but I do you know, think it's important to have the places be open for whoever wants to sort of approach it, but sort of expect that full diversity in the room, I think is you know, non-realistic. However, I do want to sort of layer in another type of diversity, and that, that's something that I do think uh, the, the RI, RIRs or, you know, ITF are working on, and it's something that needs to sort of be further sort of emphasized and worked on, and that's diversity in terms of having, for instance, representation of small operators, uh, you know, small and medium enterprises, you know, producing internet standards, um, and also having sort of, uh, you know, concerted efforts to bring in gender diversity uh, in this community, so more participation of women and, and non-binary participants, uh, both in standards or RIRs. Um, so, yeah, those thoughts. Very nicely put, thank you. Uh, uh, Carolina, online? Carolina? 
uh, not she's connected. Muted. She's muted. Ah, you're, you're the, thank you. Oh, you to, uh, uh, Carolina, you need to unmute, apparently. No, I think they need to unmute. Oh, oh they, uh, um, I'm not a host, so I can't unmute. Uh, she, she, she is a host for herself, so she should be able to. She's now unmuted. Ah, did they unhost her? Oh, she's co host. Maybe no, she's it's unmuted, but um, we still can't hear her. Yeah. Ah, okay. There's a, there's a technical problem. Uh, 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 Carolina, I'm afraid we're not hearing you. Uh, let's. Uh, let's uh, shall, we, shall, we, shall we go to. to yeah, and, um, no, Professor Quainor had a comment. If you yes, want let's to go. go to I was going to say, let's go, let's go to Ni Quainor and then come back to Carolina. Uh, go ahead, so, Ni. Uh, thank you. I, I was just going to make an observation that. It's uh, to an extent the technical community's contribution to IGF is this multi-stakeholder process. So to get the question in reverse, that uh, you know, are, are the technical communities multi-stakeholder? It's uh, kind of challenging in terms of the sequence of events. Now these organizations are more importantly. We should be looking less at this multi-stakeholder bit, but more about the actual decision-making process, which is really most important. That must be as bottom-up and as inclusive as possible, and uh, you know, also making sure that merit somehow it gets captured. That that sort of activity, uh, I think, is more what is important in this regard than the fact that it has a very diverse in terms of discipline and, and, and you might say sectoral participation, uh, because in some cases it doesn't always work out that you have that diverse uh, community in terms of uh, sector and also discipline uh, in terms of the needs, uh, but uh, because they are very open and uh, they all have programs that try to bring in new people and also uh, a process of, you might say, inducting them or getting them become, uh, you know, familiar with what is going on. It is possible to, to have wider than purely the technical community participating actively in uh, the where it matters, which is in the policy development processes. Uh, now, in the case of Afrinic, you can see that some of our locations are even small. They are two very small operators. And that's a benefit of the local policies that, that can be derived at the regional level. And we also then address the language challenges that we have. In our case, we also have capacity challenges uh, because different operators have different abilities. And all these things reflect and the need tries to, in some sense, accommodate them all and, and, and then even support the environments they are in to sort of uh, enhance it or create communities around them that enables them to keep on growing in that area so that uh, it becomes strong. Now, on the issue of the resilience, uh, some of it, of course, is internal to the organization in that these bylaws need to be have certain properties in there. Uh, of course, we're evolving from a situation where things were, we had common goals, shared objective, and there was good trust to an environment where uh, because of certain new things in the, in the context, such as transfer policies, which it might have inadvertently uh, given some nod to property by, by for example, uh, you know, seeing the LIR as the one as that could initiate transfers as opposed to the end users that they serve, that sort of thing tends to stress, okay, uh, you know, the normal, uh, you know, maybe fair and efficient allocation of resources because people begin to try to game the system so that they can have this sense of the one who can initiate transfers. And, and that I think is, uh, has been some form of a challenge. But what one is looking for really is bottom-up decision-making. And I, I'm not even sure that is going on at, at IGF uh, or the, any of the uh, you know, uh, national and regional initiatives, for example, because they, they do discuss, but that they are collectively making a decision on something 
is something that you see more in the RRs and the technical communities. Uh, so I thought I would may add that. Thanks. Uh, j just to, 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 to clarify, uh, in response to Arietta's uh, question about how you see the evolution and what would be the next steps in, in terms of ability to respond to crises, uh, do I hear you saying that w once Afrinic has uh, a board and a CEO back in place, the first step is to get at the bylaws and bring them up to date to a new situation? Yeah, um, there, well, we, we have to understand what happened, okay? Um, and understanding what happened here means that uh, there was an application of a certain uh, important document, which is the registration services agreement, okay? And a bad actor signs the agreement and decides not to respect the agreement. So you end up in a commercial dispute and you need to have mechanisms to say uh, collectively that this sort of bad acting is not permitted. And usually you do that through uh, some things in the bylaws and the areas in which the person, for instance, attempts to game the system, you would have to find some ways such as in elections and and also access to people's accounts and so on, which are things that the person tried. So, so you're going to have to find some language within either your bylaws or your general uh, you know, uh, guidelines or practices that you have to discourage those kinds of things. And of course, you know, once we understand that uh, uh, there will be perhaps more litigation with value being inadvertently attached to the resources, um, we're also going to have to maybe uh, be very careful with the law and be more responsive with the law and, and maybe strengthen our own governance procedures to make sure that you are not found in the same situation. And if you are found in the situation, what other structures within the organization can step in. So all of these things are being thought, up, thought about. And presumably once, you know, we, we have good fair election and we get a board in place some of these things we follow there are of course policies also waiting that can eliminate this problem one of them is uh, a transfer policy of our own uh, which by the way the the bad actor attempted to you know overturn through the courts see the bad actor when the multi-stakeholder process failed for them they now try to top down to go to court and then try and overrule this bottom-up process, which also was you know, sort of set aside. So it tells that uh, once the initial bit is, is resolved, uh, there are clearly some key things that can be done. For example, how do we enforce arbitration before we go to courts and so on. So there are some things that we can do to, to strengthen the, the resilience. Great, thanks. Thanks very much, Ni. We are coming up to time. Um, thanks for everyone for being here uh, through the full discussion. I just have a last chance uh, for Carolina in case her mic is working now, and then I'll, and a last word to Akinori also here on, the, on on site. Carolina, are you able to speak to us with us now? Can you hear me? We can, do. Yes. Off you go. Wonderful. Okay, no, it's, so just to bring in another issue on, on the terms of how we define these regions and whether it's the RIRs, like this artificial construct around regions and who and why are they defined in the way they are. So um, I, I do think that they are not the only ones who are working around these parameters. And I think that the RIRs have set up a process and I'm speaking particularly of what I see in the Latin American Caribbean region where you do have sub-regions and, and, and maybe processes within, for example, the Caribbean, et cetera, but then you do have other 
processes concerning the DNS, concerning academic networks, etc., which are all using the same regional definition of what is Latin American and the Caribbean. And I find that this is this is very interesting in, in for example, in a region that doesn't have, a, it's not a trade block on its own or a political block as the European Union. And so I think that this raises a lot of food for thought on how maybe the internet can also help, help define and redefine this imaginaries around these geographies and, and cultures and, and, and policies and citizenship around the internet in these parts of the world. Thank you. Thanks, and a last word to our local host. <laughs> no local host. Uh, th thank you very much. That's really, uh, really great session with uh, with a lot of intervention. I, I yes, we uh, uh, our discussion has been quite focused on the, its gov governance of the IRS, but uh, that's that's uh, how to decide. But I'd like to I'd like to uh, mention uh, the the what to do the. Uh, and uh, that, that was uh, that was Kevin Swift from the LACNIC who made an uh, excellent presentation in the uh, uh, African Internet Summit two weeks ago. Uh, the title is "The Our IRS Beyond the Registry Services." Uh, that uh, that's, uh, that uh, presented a very good set of the, the what, what kind of activity the regional internet registries uh, are doing for the development and capacity building. It is a really, really important point, but, uh, and then it is increasing. And, uh, the RIR is not, not only doing the, the uh, IP address management, but doing the helping the people to uh, have the, the another capacity to run the internet better. So, for example, in case of the APNIC, uh, the, the development budget is actually as, as much as the membership and the, the registration service budget. It is tremendous. Uh, how, how big? Uh, you, you can see the, the RIR is spending the money to the development. Uh, additionally, the APNIC uh, is doing the foundation, uh, established the, uh, the foundation to uh, utilize uh, the, su such, a, such a funding to the uh, additional development. So uh, the, the, the membership uh, uh, who gathers to the, the RIRs subsidizes their, their funding to the development, which is another, another way how the RIR uh, underpins the Internet's better, better operation. And then uh, that's, that's my uh, the last comment. Thank you very much. Just a quick comment from me. I think um, we also need to recognize the regional specificity. So, so I, I completely accept the, the points about the multi-stakeholder model and not every IIR needs to be multi-stakeholder. It's part of a broader multi-stakeholder ecosystem. But maybe in some regions, something different might be usable. You know, if you look at Africa, it's a region that has regional policy. It's like Europe, but without the capacity. So the role of the RIR in Africa is particularly important in the African Digital Transformation Strategy, the African Union's Agenda 2063. Having a technical community voice at an institutional level in those processes is extremely important. And if the AFRINIC ecosystem itself, if the if the technical registry ecosystem doesn't give AFRINIC enough of a resource pool to draw on, then maybe it can draw on a slightly wider uh, resource pool, bringing in people from the private sector and from civil society in a more explicit way. So I'm not saying that's the solution, I'm just saying look at the role, look at the opportunity, be regionally context specific, and then the one thing that we haven't heard enough of is the NROs. So maybe that can be the topic for the workshop next year, how to evolve the umbrella structure. Great, every, every, every project and every discussion is great when it finishes with ideas for the next one. Um, good, uh, we come to the, to the close here. Thanks very, very much to all the participants, uh, both speakers and panel and you in the audience here. I hope that you have uh, uh, consolidated thoughts uh, about the RIRs. If you're experienced, I hope you've been exposed to them and got and seen that there's an exciting world out there if the RIRs were new for you. Um, thanks again to everyone also for being here on this early morning on the last day of the IGF. Uh, let's go get our coffee and give ourselves a hand for being here.